Vanguard has disrupted both UK funds and platforms for the better, forcing competitors to lower their fees or lose customers. But you don't have to be on Vanguard's platform to buy their funds, which begs the question, which are the best Vanguard funds? And that's what we address in this video. Now, don't forget, if you do enjoy our content, please do subscribe to our channel and like this video. It helps us a lot. So let's look at the best UK Vanguard funds in a bit more detail. To find what's best, we have to have a handle on what's good. Now, normally we think about high returns when we think about investing, but that's not all we have to think about. We might also consider what risk you have to take to generate that return. Ideally, you'd want a high return with a low risk. And also what we don't want is for fees to eat away our returns. So we'd also go for low cost funds if possible. Now it's not just the management fee of the fund which matters, it's also the holding fee to hold it on a given platform, which varies widely. So we'll consider that also when considering our total cost of ownership. Now let's look at some returns for Vanguard funds. Beside me here, you can see the last decade of returns for the Vanguard funds which have been around that long, and these returns are annualized. There's no surprise that the US is the best performer. That's generated about 15% returns over that decade. And any fund which also contains a lot of US stocks, like this Developed World X UK fund, about 60% of that is US stocks, that's also performed very well. But notice that we also have things like global small caps. They tend to outperform over the long term. And over the last decade, that's certainly been a pretty good performance. Japan has also put in a pretty good innings. You can see that it's generated over 9% per year on average. Then we get to the UK all share, which has generated 7.8%. And you can see that emerging markets have actually been quite disappointing over this period, generating less than 6%. The lowest returns tend to come in the fixed income category because bonds don't tend to generate good long-term returns. We buy those more for safety than we do for return. And if we're talking about safety, we'd consider a risk measure like volatility, for example. That's what we can see on this risk return plot. So the y-axis here is return with low returns at the bottom, high returns at the top, and the x-axis is risk as measured by volatility, which is the typical annual percentage price move. Very volatile funds tend to be more risky than the ones which have low volatility because they tend to crash more. So ideally what we'd have is a fund with low risk and high return. But unfortunately, as you can see, there aren't any of those. What we can see is that the safest funds with the lowest volatility are here on the left, and these are all fixed income funds. They buy bonds but they certainly pay the price in terms of return. Notice how they're low down on the y-axis. Then we've got this unfortunate group of funds over here, which have high risk and low return. In other words, the worst of both worlds. That includes two fixed income funds. Remember that fixed income has been completely crushed over the course of the last year as interest rates increased. And funds with the longest duration have the highest volatility, and have lost the most over this period of time. So that's long duration gilts, that's UK government bonds, and long duration UK inflation linked gilts, which also have a very long duration. But we also have emerging market stocks here, which as we saw, have also done very badly over the last decade in terms of return. And as we saw previously, the US and developed world X UK and small caps have certainly had very good returns, but also came with very high risk. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that these will generate the best returns in future. In fact, it means quite the opposite. Now let's turn to life strategy, which is kind of like a one-stop shop for building your portfolio. And that's because it already contains everything. It contains global equity, global bonds, and it's dialed up in terms of risk from life strategy 20 up to life strategy 100, according to how much stocks it contains. The more risk you take generally, the higher the return you should expect, such that Life Strategy 100, which is all stocks, has generated the best historic returns. And that's over the 12 years since these funds have been around. What's kind of interesting over the last year, though, is that despite Life Strategy 20 containing a lot of bonds, which is supposedly safe, because those bonds have sold off so much, it's actually well below its all-time high. Whereas Life Strategy 100 
is already pushing new all-time highs. So why wouldn't I consider life strategy funds to be the best ones available from Vanguard? Well, this is why. Beneath me here, you can see the composition of Life Strategy 100 in terms of the funds which it buys itself, which are other Vanguard funds. Now, what I've done is to add up the contribution from all the UK stock funds which are in Life Strategy 100. So that's the FTSE UK All Share, the FTSE 100, which are large caps, and the FTSE 250, which are mid caps. Now, if we compare that with the global index, like the MSCI All Country World Index, you can see that the UK only makes up 4%, in fact, less than 4% of that index, because the UK is a very small equity market. It's smaller than Apple, in fact. So what we see with life strategy is a huge overweight of 6.5 times what you'd expect if you simply weighted based on the size of the UK market. Now, that would be OK if the UK were to be expected to outperform massively. However, I think that's unlikely given its poor historic performance. So this is one reason why I think I'd probably avoid life strategy in any of its forms because of the huge UK overweight. Now, I've made previous videos in which I showed how to reproduce the returns of life strategy funds, but using other funds offered by Vanguard. Why would you do that? Now, for starters, it's much cheaper. The fee is only 0.12% rather than 0.22%. Of course, you have to rebalance yourself, which you don't have to do with life strategy. But what you can do is dial down that UK overweight and allocate more to global equity. Now, if you're a member of Pension Craft, you get access to a spreadsheet which gives you all of those weights. It also shows how you can use iShares funds to make an even cheaper version of life strategy. You also get access to lots of other goodies like members only videos, but also the chat application Slack so you can ask a question whenever you want. If you want to learn more about that, just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. So much for historic returns. How about future returns? Nobody knows what these are, but let's hear what Vanguard thinks they'll be. This is from their 10-year outlook, and it has a model which predicts what's going to happen to various asset classes over that decade. These are nominal returns, so they're not adjusted for inflation, but they are total returns, so it's assuming you reinvest your dividends. Now, over this period of time, despite the UK being quite cheap, Vanguard doesn't expect it'll outperform funds outside the UK. The UK is expected to return 5.6% per year, whereas global ex-UK equity will return 7.1%, considerably more. But what's also interesting is that Vanguard expects emerging market equity unhedged to generate 8.2, which is even higher. That's partly because emerging markets are very cheap at the moment, but also presumably because Vanguard thinks they'll grow earnings more rapidly than elsewhere. If we look at the US outlook, which is different from the UK one, you can see that if we split things into US equity versus ex-US equity, because the US is so expensive relative to other markets, Vanguard thinks it'll underperform over the next decade. So ex-US, it expects equity to generate 8.4% per year, whereas US equity will only generate 5.7%, according to their model. Switching back to the UK outlook, we can see the forecast for fixed income funds, bond funds, are also looking pretty attractive. For example, emerging market sovereign bonds are expected to generate 7.2% which is equity-like returns. And UK corporate bond funds, which are investment grade, high credit quality, will generate 6.1% according to the model. Global credit without any sterling hedge will generate 5.8. And even boring old UK government bonds will generate 4.3%. And that's one of the benefits of having higher yields now. It generates a higher income. In fact, even cash is expected to generate 4.2% on average. Now, what's also interesting, and which leads to one of my gripes later on, is that the very strong dollar is expected to reverse course. Vanguard thinks that the US dollar will weaken as global risk appetite improves and equities go higher. So if it decomposes the US return and compares it with all country world index return, excluding the US, the reason why it thinks excluding the US increases the return is partly because the US is expensive, that adds almost 1% to the ex-US index, 
Earnings growth is expected to be stronger in the US, so that subtracts 0.7%, excluding the US. Dividend yield favours ex-US because the US is usually very stingy when it comes to dividends, but a huge 1.2% will be added to the ex-US index by not having that dollar weakening effect. So ideally what we'd like is to either be able to buy stocks globally, excluding the US, to avoid their weaker returns, but also the effect of the weakening dollar, or to be able to buy global equity, but hedged into sterling. So then the dollar effect will not affect us. Now, what's great about Vanguard funds is they tend to have low fund management fees. Now, if we do look at the passive funds which are offered by Vanguard, these are the ones which you just track an index and don't try to beat it, the fees tend to be very low. The total expense ratio is what you can see here, and even for the most expensive one, it's less than 0.3% per year. The dash red line you can see is what I gauge to be expensive for a UK fund. And the ones which do tend to be expensive are the ones which buy assets in illiquid markets, where trading costs tend to be high. So that would include things like small cap stocks, emerging market government bonds, or even emerging market stocks. The things which you can see at the bottom, which are the cheapest, are from the most liquid markets and from developed markets. So that's developed market stocks, but also developed market government bonds. So I think Vanguard really excels here in offering low cost funds, not always the lowest, but certainly amongst the lowest in any category. Now, one of the things that Vanguard stresses is that it doesn't just offer passive funds. It also offers a suite of active funds where the game is that the fund manager is trying to beat the market rather than copy the market. Unfortunately, with Vanguard, as with other active fund managers, you can see that the fund fees are very high here. All but one of them, which is their money market fund, are above the 0.2%, which I consider to be expensive. So personally, I'd avoid these expensive active funds on their platform. And I don't think any of these would make it into my preferred best list for Vanguard funds. Now, the total cost of ownership of a fund isn't just the management fee, but also how much it costs to hold it on a given platform. To see what I mean, let's consider an example where we just have one fund and we either hold it on Vanguard's platform or we hold it on an alternative platform like Interactive Investor. And here I'm assuming we've got an ISA, an individual savings account, and on Interactive Investor, we're going to use their investor plan. Now, the cost of that is $9.99 a month, which adds up to 120 per year. But crucially, it's a fixed fee, which doesn't vary according to how much you own on the platform. Vanguard's fee is a percentage fee, but it's capped at £375 a year. And that has really important consequences. So let's say you're only going to buy, say, £10,000 worth of this fund. On Vanguard's platform, you'll pay a fee of 0.15% times 10,000. That's £15 per year, not much at all. Whereas on Interactive Investor, you'd still be paying 120 per year. So Vanguard would be much cheaper. If we increase the amount we hold to 80,000, well, now we've matched Interactive Investor's fee of 120 pounds per year. So the fee on both platforms will be the same. Now, I haven't considered transaction fees, which you do have to pay on Interactive Investor and which you don't pay on Vanguard, assuming you don't deal in real time with an ETF. But if we increase the amount now to 250,000, well, now you can see that Vanguard's hit its cap, which is 375 per year. But if you look at Interactive Investor, it's still 120 because the fee doesn't change. So once we cross that threshold of £80,000, you can see that Interactive Investor becomes cheaper. And if we take it up to a million pounds invested, well, Vanguard's hit its cap of 375, but that's always going to be higher than 120 per year on Interactive Investor. So the key take home here is that it's not always cheapest to buy Vanguard funds on its own platform. It's often cheaper to buy them on another platform. You can buy the same stuff, you'll just pay less to hold it. And that leads me on to the gripes I have with Vanguard. Now in my core portfolio, I've only got two funds. One is a global equity fund, one is a global bond fund. But what's really annoying is that there's no cheap global equity fund, which is an accumulation fund that automatically reinvests its dividends. Instead, I had to choose a fund which was developed ex-UK, which we'll see later, 
which did have a low fee, but which excludes emerging markets and the UK, which is not something I necessarily wanted to do. Why would you not offer that on your platform? It's the most basic building block of any portfolio. I just don't get why they've excluded it. Given the fact that their own outlook expects the US to underperform over the next decade, why don't they offer an ex-US global fund? The only alternative is to make up a global index with lots of other funds, which is really annoying. If your own outlook says that that's what you should do, then maybe you should make a fund to do it. Also, another alternative is to have a sterling hedged US fund. That way, the currency effect, which will be a drag on returns, according to Vanguard, wouldn't be a problem. But again, no sign of it on their platform. Personally, I think there are lots of opportunities outside stocks and government bonds. So why not offer a high yield corporate bond fund? There are some real opportunities there when that market crashes, but I can't buy it on their platform. And the only hedge which worked over the course of the last 12 months would have been some kind of commodity fund. But again, you can't find one on Vanguard's platform. Now, these aren't esoteric weird funds. These are fairly standard. So I think Vanguard should offer them. And so finally, let's turn to what I consider to be the best funds offered by Vanguard in the UK. Now, if you filter on Vanguard's platform based on global equity funds, and they have to be accumulation funds because they reinvest the dividends, that's what most people want. And I also want passive funds because I don't want the fee to be too high. You get these five funds. Now, remember I said that I have just two funds on my core portfolio, which I hold on Vanguard, and now this is one of them. I chose the one with the lowest fee of 0.14%. The other funds all have fees of more than 0.2%. Now, ideally, I'd have liked to fund. HSBC offers one, for example, which has a fee of 0.12, but a fund which is global, which includes the UK and emerging markets. But Vanguard don't offer one. So... I think the best global one is this one, the Developed World XUK Equity Index Fund. And the fee for that is 0.14. I also have a global bond fund. And again, I chose the cheapest one, which is this global bond index fund. It's another accumulation fund. The fee is 0.15. I didn't want to get a short-term bond index fund because I think at the moment, now that yields are higher, you'll probably be better off with something which has slightly more duration because the income tends to be higher. So that would be my choice for bond fund. Now, I know some people like dividends. So if you're in that camp, then I think the FTSE All World High Dividend Yield ETF is probably one of the better ones. The fee is a little bit high at 0.29%. You often see that with high yield funds. But what I like about this fund is that it's global. So it does give you global diversification while still offering a fairly high dividend. So there we are. Those are my favourite funds offered by Vanguard and the criteria I'd use to choose them. Now, your criteria might be different, so just use this as a kind of starting point for your own research. Now, don't forget our offer. If you want to join our membership and have access to that spreadsheet that lets you copy and adjust the weights of a life strategy-like portfolio, you can do that by clicking on the link beside me and in the description beneath me to learn more. And as always, thank you for listening.